movie uh, of a car accident. And they, uh, after the movie was over, they were asked questions about the details of this accident that they had just witnessed. Uh, subjects in the traditional scientific way were randomly divided into two groups who were treated identically, uh, except for one word in one, of the, one phrase, actually, in one of the many questions they were asked. The, what I'll call the bump group was asked for this question. Uh, how fast were the cars going when they bumped into each other? Uh, the other group was asked, how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other? So apart from that one phraseology change, everybody was treated identically. So the first uh, result to emerge from this experiment is that the smash group gave a higher speed estimate than the bump group. If you ask people who saw exactly the same thing and were otherwise treated identically, how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other, they give a higher speed estimate than if they're asked how fast were the cars going when they bumped into each other. That's interesting in the sense that it tells you about some about the effect of uh, leading or suggested questions on the answer you have. But what's more relevant uh, as opposed to good information is that a week later, uh, everybody was brought back into the lab and they were asked some more questions about this accident they had seen a week earlier. One of which, did you see any broken glass? In fact, there hadn't been any broken glass, so the correct answer to this question would be no. Uh, but, as it turns out, uh, the group originally asked about speed using the verb smash uh, gave, uh, were considerably more likely to incorrectly report that there was broken glass than people asked about speed using the verb bump. So the interpretation of this finding is that the verb smashed acted as a source of post-event information. It was subtle, it was embedded in the question, but nevertheless, it suggested to people who heard it that uh, the accident that they saw was a violent one, uh, two cars smashed into each other, they were therefore more likely to add to their memory uh, details, false details, that were consistent with a violent accident, like uh, broken life. So in other words, um, we have the original memory that's relatively uh, benign to the severity of the accident. Uh, there's post-event information provided, which gets integrated into the memory, uh, resulting in an accident that, in their memory, was much more severe than it actually was. In a crime, particularly one that involves eyewitness identification, um, the most common form of post-event information uh, comes as a result of identification procedures. Uh, in other words, when, as in the original example I described, when a witness picks out and uh, identifies somebody in any sort of identification procedure, they are able to use the appearance of the person they just selected as uh, a basis for reconstructing their memory of the original event such that uh, an important component of their original memory, uh, namely the appearance of the perpetrator, which originally might have been fairly hazy, is replaced by a stronger memory of the appearance of the person that they identify in the identification procedure. I should say, just to be clear, that this is a completely unconscious process. People don't consciously add uh, information, at least not usually, uh, to their memories. It's a process that is very human, that takes place normally and uh, automatically and unconsciously. So if, for example, uh, oh, so, so what that means is that you have to be particularly worried about biased identification or unreliable identification procedures. Uh, there are two consequences of, of them. First, uh, biased procedures make it more likely that an innocent victim will be chosen from the procedure. Uh, second, uh, and more subtly, uh, as I just said, the appearance of a person chosen by a witness in a biased identification procedure can act as a form of post-event information. So uh, if you have a description from a witness like this, uh, you provide a lineup like uh, this, there's really only one person in this lineup that matches uh, the description the witness gave. The witness can look at this lineup, rule out uh, four or five people, and choose the only one that uh, is consistent with the description uh, that they gave. An even worse or less reliable uh, form of identification procedure is the one I described uh, earlier today. That is the show-up procedure where only one person is uh, presented to the witness. Uh, in the show-up procedure, the witness is perfectly at liberty to 
to say, yes, that's the guy who I saw from the time, or no. Uh, their inclination to say yes can be influenced, can often is influenced by all kinds of things that have nothing to do with what we're interested in, namely their memory of the perpetrator. Their inclination to say yes can be influenced by their expectations that this is the guy, by any pressure uh, put on them by the police, and so forth and so on. Um, unconscious transference, uh, this often happens that, uh, not often, but occasionally happens, that uh, turns out that the suspect in a crime uh, can be shown to have had some degree of association with the witness in the past. Uh, they live in the same apartment complex, that's it. In that case, uh, the witness would be looking at, let's say, a lineup that has only one person in the suspect who would look familiar to him, five other people, not as fillers, who would look unfamiliar to him and may well choose the suspect on the basis of uh, the suspect looking familiar uh, on that basis alone. Uh, sometimes the witness sees pictures of the suspect in the media prior to undertaking any identification procedure, and so forth and so on. There, there are many ways in which identifications can be biased in such a way that a witness uh, can use the appearance of the person they've selected uh, as a form of posting that information to supplement their memory of the actual perpetrator's appearance. So um, this sort of gets us to, I guess, the bottom line. When should a witness's confidence not be taken as indicative of the witness's accuracy? Accuracy, well, number one, as I said originally, when there's poor memory for the original event, and number two, when there are contaminating sources of potentially false post-event information. And I've already listed a number of factors that uh, would jointly lead to a poor memory of the original event, as well as a variety of sources of contaminating post-event information. It is this situation uh, that lead to an altered uh, and biased memory for the original event uh, that would lead to the testimony in court that I started off talking to you uh, about. Now, uh, what I want to do is talk about two cases. Uh, I'll try to do this briefly to leave time for questions. Uh, two cases um, that I've uh, participated in that uh, can illustrate the application of uh, some of these principles that I've just talked about. Um, the first involved a truck train accident in Alaska about 15 years ago. So um, here's the cast of characters, important to know. Um, in this truck involved in the accident, there are two guys named Lee Wheeler and Wade Nelson. For some reason, I have to use their actual names. Um, and these are, these are sleazeballs, to not to find a point on them. Um, these are guys who are really nasty, who the cops would really like to see uh, in jail. Um, the other main character here is a train engineer and uh, his name was Frank Collender. Um, this isn't an actual picture of them, this is a picture I got from the internet, but it, it meant to demonstrate what was actually true. Namely that uh, the engineer, who's going to be the main witness here, was a very kindly, very honest seeming and, and honest, uh, well-meaning guy. He's somebody that, that raised with uh, anybody. So here's what happened. Uh, on June 7, 1992, uh, Wheeler and Nelson uh, are driving from Fairbanks to Anchorage, their salute, in Nelson's truck. Uh, they're both very drunk. Uh, we are later able to tell for a variety of reasons. Um, at, the, at a railway crossing about halfway between the two cities, uh, their truck smashes into a freight train and it explodes. Um, and when I mean explodes, it really did. Wheeler, luckily for him, uh, was thrown from the truck uh, onto the roadway, and uh, he survived. Uh, Nelson, unfortunately for him, uh, remained in the truck, and he, he, he became uh, extremely uh, dead. Um, Colin, this kindly, honest, loving train engineer, the second man, man, horrified, he stopped his train as quickly as he could. Uh, he ran back to the scene of the accident. He discovered Wheeler, that injured uh, on the highway, and he assisted him for about 45 minutes until various rescue operations arrived uh, from Anchorage. <coughs> During this time, this is important, uh, Collard did not, didn't know that there had been anybody else in, in the truck. 
all he was able to see was Cell Wheeler, the guy that he assisted uh, on the middle of the highway. Uh, now, shortly after the accident, Wheeler's name off the accident, uh, off to the hospital, I mean, the rescue personnel extinguished the flames uh, from the truck and found Nelson's body. And the police asked the train engineer, Collinger, what happened. Of issue here became who was driving the truck. Uh, the, um, uh, because people were drunk and driving recklessly, whoever was driving the truck is going to be guilty of vehicular homicide in the state of Alaska. Because these guys were sleazeballs anyway, uh, the authorities, the cops and the prosecutors, were invested in Mueller, the survivor, being the driver of the truck. Because Nelson, they, then they could put him away, and Nelson was pissed about him. Uh, was dead. Um, so they rely on the testimony of uh, Mr. Collinger, who reported the following. He said, the driver was Wheeler. So he figured Wheeler was the, the, the truck driver. That guy who was lying in the house. Just before his truck smashed into my train, I looked directly at his face. He couldn't have been more than 10 feet away. and was coming straight at me, and he was looking at me. I couldn't figure out why he looked so calm and why he wasn't slowing down. I've never been so horrified in my life. That fireball was awful. It was like out of the movies or something. Um, this is important. His memory couldn't be more than 10 feet away.